In 1967, Muhammad Ali was summoned before the draft board, the selective service in Texas. This was, of course, at the height of the Vietnam War, and the US military needed more soldiers, more Marines, more airmen, more sailors. Now, Ali did show up at the draft board building, but he refused to be drafted. He refused to serve in the military. And he cited his religious beliefs as a member of the nation of Islam, explaining that from his perspective, he was permitted to fight in a war only if it was a defensive war. As far as Muhammad Ali and many others were concerned, of course, the United States government's presence in Vietnam was anything but defensive. Ali asked to be considered a conscientious objector, a legal status that allows someone to serve in a non-military capacity in lieu of service in the military. However, the draft board and later the Department of Justice denied Ali's claim to be a conscientious objector and they went forward and prosecuted him for draft dodging. Soon thereafter, Ali was also stripped of his title as heavyweight champion of the world and was forbidden for participating in future boxing matches. So not only was he facing up to five years of prison, but his means of livelihood had been taken away from him. Now, if we fast forward a few years, eventually in 1971, the Supreme Court did exonerate Ali, although it has to be said on rather technical grounds, but they did overturn his conviction and argue that the government had not made a good case for why Muhammad Ali could not be considered a conscientious objector. Of course, in the four years between 1967 and 1971, Ali was nevertheless condemned in the court of public opinion. Although Ali came to be this celebrated American and decades later, at the time, he was a deeply despised figure, especially among white journalists, who of course dominated the sports writing world, then as now. Many condemned Ali as a coward and an opportunist, and like the draft board in the Department of Justice, they did not take his religious convictions seriously. Ultimately, most white Americans simply regarded Muhammad Ali as nothing but a traitor. Of course, from Muhammad Ali's standpoint, this accusation of treason completely missed the point. Since 1964, Muhammad Ali had been a public member of the Nation of Islam, and in fact had been worshiping with them for at least two years prior. And since that time, he had been clear about where his loyalties lay, with his people, his fellow black Americans, and with God, period. Of course, this did not placate his critics. The fact that Ali was public about the fact that he felt no loyalty to the US government didn't really help him in the public's image, at least not at that time. But he had made this point and he had made it clearly. As we'll see, Ali actually spent a lot of time defending himself in public, although whether his statements were given enough attention is another question. But what I'd like for us to think about now, more than 50 years after this case, is what do we think of Muhammad Ali's position? Do we think that he should have been regarded as a conscientious objector? Even more importantly, as we reflect on Muhammad Ali's loyalties, I think it's important, critical, for us to ask ourselves this question. Where do our loyalties lie in this life? As we ponder that question, I think it might be instructive for us to reflect on our first reading this morning, our Hebrew Bible reading, back on page four. I know we've assaulted you with a variety of readings this morning, so if you need a refresher, you could turn back to page four. Our reading is from the first book of Samuel, chapter eight. Now, uh, the books of Samuel pick up at an interesting time in the history of the Israelites. It's been many generations, perhaps 200 years since their liberation from slavery in Egypt. They've settled in the land of Canaan, not without 
quite a bit of conflict, but they have settled themselves in this promised land. For many generations, they've been living there, independent and autonomous. And there are basically 12 tribes. It's a little bit more complicated than that. But for our purposes today, there are 12 tribal groupings, each with their own piece of land. They're living more or less in peace with each other, but each of these tribal groupings is really independent. There's no central administrative government over these tribes, and there's certainly no central human leader. No president, no king, no emperor of Israel. There's no real central government. Now, at times, wars and other crises, of course, call for decisive action, and what happens is that charismatic leaders arise as they are needed. Leaders known a little bit confusingly in English as the judges. They did do some judging, but they were actually mostly military leaders. If you're really curious about these judges, you can learn more about them in the book of Judges. It's pretty well named. But these judges arise when a problem is present, but once the crisis is over, they just go back home. They don't become the king of Israel. They go back to their farm or whatever their work is and continue their own private life. This has been the system of government, if you can call it that, for at least a century, quite likely more. We might say, very simply, the way that our text summarizes it today, that the Israelites have no human leader, they have no central human leader, no king, because in essence, God is supposed to be their king. As we see in our reading today, this solution was becoming unpopular. The people are agitating for a king, a human king, one with a crown who sits on a throne. They wanted a king who fought with them, not with the spirit, but with the sword. They wanted, like most people, like all nations do, more power, more prestige, more wealth. Yes, they had this small tract of land in Canaan, but now they were ready for more. They wanted to expand just like Egypt, just like Assyria, just like Babylon, just like Rome would in future centuries. They wanted to expand their power, and they realized that God wasn't really interested in having them expand their power. God thought that they had enough, and they thought that a human king would agree with them that mm, enough was okay, but more would be better. They wanted to structure their politics, in other words, like other nations did. They wanted a pharaoh, an emperor, a king of their own. As we hear today, God and the prophet Samuel are dismayed to hear this. This radical experiment in a community centered not on human power but on divine power is threatened and, in, and indeed seems to be coming to an end. You heard it a few moments ago. Samuel launches this long monologue warning the people about what will happen. I'm not going to read it again, but you, you heard it. All the things that the king would do, all the things that the king would take from the people, right? They expected the king would bring them more power and more treasure, but Samuel warns them that it's just the reverse. Kings don't give, they take. It may, it may be worth noting that Samuel launches his invective by talking about the fact that a king would draft their sons into the military. The more things change, the more things stay the same. Now, ultimately, the people would, in fact, get a king. First Saul, who doesn't work out that well, and then the famous David. Kingship would come to Israel. But it's worth pausing here at this moment, because in many ways, I think that 1 Samuel chapter 8 is a passage about this question of loyalty. Where do our loyalties lie? Where did the loyalties of the Israelites lie? Are they ultimately loyal to God? Loyal to the one who liberated them from slavery? The one who called them to ethical living through the law? Are they loyal to the one who, through them, is trying to build a more just society? Or do they want to be loyal to the nation, loyal to a king, seeking more power and more wealth for themselves, seeking to consume more than they produce, 
as most nations seek to do. What vision of life are they going to be loyal to? 1 Samuel is, of course, an ancient text, maybe nearly 3,000 years old, and its language can feel antiquated. After all, this question of kings may seem irrelevant to us. We Americans have never had a king, at least not as the United States of America, and at least not yet, right? But the question that Samuel is asking here, I think, is as critical today as it has ever been. Where do our loyalties lie? Are we Americans, first and foremost, bound to defend the interests of our nation before all others and no matter what? Or are we perhaps Christians first, bound to obey Christ and to serve God, God the creator of all people, God the lover of all people? Put another way, does God love America more than other nations? Does God love America more than Belgium? Does God love America more than Angola? Does God love America more than Japan? I don't share Muhammad Ali's particular religious identity. That's pretty obvious. And I think that the Nation of Islam, like all religious groups, comes in for some valid criticism. But, but, I think Ali was absolutely correct to hold to his convictions and insist that ultimately his loyalty was to God and to the truth, not to any nation, not even his own nation. Ali, when asked, actually explained his position with eloquent directness. When a journalist in 1967 asked him why he was refusing to be drafted, this is what Ali himself said. Why should they ask me to put on a uniform and go 10,000 miles from home and drop bombs and bullets on brown people in Vietnam while so-called Negro people in Louisville are treated like dogs and denied simple human rights? <coughs> In other words, why should Muhammad Ali be loyal to a government that had shown no loyalty to him or to his people? Moving back another hundred years, we're time traveling a bit today, but moving back to the 1860s, during another difficult war, Abraham Lincoln was also approached by many journalists and Famously, one journalist asked Lincoln, in the midst of the Civil War, I think this was 1862 or 1863, this journalist asked Lincoln, Mr. President, do you believe that God is on our side? Is, is God on the side of the Union? Lincoln, likewise, responded with his own eloquent directness. Sir, my concern is not whether God is on our side. My greatest concern is whether we are on God's side. My friends, may it be so. Amen.